Good morning. morning. It's good to see everybody this morning, and uh, it's uh, not too bad down here up at uh, our house. It's snowing this morning, so I I guess uh, winter's winter's coming sooner or later. Uh, Lots of announcements. Make sure you take uh, note in your bulletin. A lot going on at this time of year, even with all the restrictions. Tonight, we'll be having a DVD night here at the church at 530, uh, Christmas Tree Miracle, so anybody would like to come out for that? Monday's Eat and Greet, that's at Beanie's house, so uh, everybody that's involved in that's invited there. Just make sure you let her know so she, she can plan. Wednesday night, we have a deacons meeting, so all the deacons, that'll be at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, right after the Bible study and prayer meeting. We're uh, doing our family project, uh, like we often do, and uh, so there's a bin in the back if you, wanna, if you have any gifts that you want to put in there. Also, if you want to do a monetary donation, just make sure you note that on your envelope uh, when you put that in so that they know that that's what you want the, the money to go to. Next Sunday, we're having a special. I know the Bell Choir has been practicing a lot and uh, preparing, so they're going to be doing both services next Sunday. So. Uh, just encourage everybody to come out for that. Maybe you want to invite somebody to come out and listen to that bell choir, but uh, just a Christmas concert next Sunday. Also take note, there's lots of Christmas cards. So there's a Christmas card exchange rack out in the, the breezeway. Also there's uh, on the bulletin board, there's cards that we've gotten from uh, missionaries and other people to the whole church. So if you want to take a look at those, uh, make sure you take a look at that as well. And finally, I just... You know, sometimes all the information doesn't get out there at this time uh, with everything going on, but I have heard that there's a former deacon of this church who's signed up to get a tattoo this week. So it's a little bit unclear exactly what's going on, but you might want to talk to Uncle Wayne and find out what's going on about this tattoo. So. Okay, then. <coughs> For all the other former deacons, they're glad that we don't have to speculate any further. (laughs) In case uh, you are looking to invite somebody next Sunday's uh, bell choirs, there are little flyers and handouts on all the tables you can take with you to hand out and invite people to come and hear that next Sunday morning. So they are there for you to uh, utilize and take with you. Uh, We are thankful that we are able to worship the Lord and uh, praise the Lord. On the Christmas card uh, mailbox thing that's in the breezeway. I had 44 slots and I filled 43 of them with folks who are somewhat regularly attending one of the services. If you would like us, there are some who aren't, who are still at home uh, for health reasons and other reasons. Uh, if you leave cards for them, we'll get them to them by probably mail, put them together and save a little bit of postage rather than everybody mailing them. Those are on the top big open slot. If you have extra cards, you can't find the slot for somebody, just throw those up there. We'll mail them out after next Sunday and get them to whosoever they need to go to. But uh, we tried to make a slot for everybody who's regularly attending one or the other service. We are thankful for the opportunity to worship the Lord this morning. Let's pray together as we uh, join together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we are thankful uh, for your provisions, for your help, your strength. We are thankful for the advent of Jesus Christ, our Savior, what he did for us, what he came to earth to provide. Uh, It is truly remarkable as we think about uh, the, the coming from the glory of heaven to ending up in the place called earth, with its problems, with its sin, with everything that we see around us, and yet you, out of love and willingness, came here, and it's what this season's about. And so we thank you for that and pray that as we worship you today that you might minister to our hearts and encourage us, and we'll thank you for all your blessings in Jesus' name, amen. Val's going to play, and we have some Christmas songs for each of us to sing together.
This morning's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. If you'd like to follow along, again, that's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he had saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what, the, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted because they are no more. May God bless the reading of his word. We're going to pray this morning for our needs that we have. There are many on the list, so uh, you can take the list and pray for them throughout the week, but we'll join together this morning and pray. Almighty God, we come before you today recognizing that you provide for our needs. You minister to our, our hurts, our bodily problems, our troubles. You minister to the needs we have, whatever they might be. We can count upon you and depend upon you. Just as you faithfully promised for thousands of years that Jesus would come, he did. And just as you've promised to us the faithful answer to our prayers, those will be as attended to as Jesus' coming was. They will be accomplished. And we thank you for that. We come before you praying for those who have physical needs, those who are dealing with uh, either recovery from surgical procedures, looking toward surgical procedures, some with illnesses and sickness, many uh, dealing with COVID, and many dealing with uh, the consequences of quarantines and the inconvenience of those. We certainly pray for those folks that you would touch their bodies, heal and help those who are in that need in particular. Pray that you would provide for those with long-term needs, those with cancer, those with other illnesses, that you would minister to them and encourage them and strengthen their bodies. We'd also ask that you would uh, provide for the needs around us in our world. We live in a world that is greatly troubled in these days. And we certainly pray for those who lead in, in governmental positions to have wisdom. But we certainly realize the, uh, the difficulties of this, this time frame that we live in and pray for those around us in, in, in charge and who make decisions that they might make wise ones. Pray for our missionaries as they serve in various countries around this world at this Christmas season, that you might use them to further the ministry and message of Christ, uh, using the time of Advent and Christmas to particularly be a blessing uh, with the gospel message that they present. 
Pray that you would provide for uh, all of those who are in our military service, keeping them in your care and safety, even those that face separation from family due to the distance of the military service. We pray for your strengthening for them also. We'd ask for all these provisions, knowing that you're faithful and knowing that you're a God of providing strength and help and wisdom whenever we need it and however we need it. We certainly pray for these things as a group, but as we come as individuals with a few moments of opportunity to bring our requests before you individually, that you will answer those requests that are on our hearts in the same manner that you answer the ones we've prayed publicly for. And we'll thank you for all your answers, for we pray them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. As we uh, come to our Christmas messages this month, last week we looked at Jesus bringing joy to a world of hardship. Today we'll move in a different direction, talking about Jesus bringing forgiveness to a world of wickedness. I know we have some soccer fans out there. We have one player. She's, are you a star soccer player? Borderline star. We have a borderline star player. How many of you watch soccer? Anybody watch it on TV? Oh, the, the player doesn't even watch. Look at that. <laughs> well, this, for, for Justin, this is for you. But you've got to go to Scotland. In Scotland, of course, with the pandemic, there's no fans in the stands. Uh, us football fans are aware of that, how that looks. No fans in the stands, but they are broadcasting soccer matches. And in, uh, just in October... They were broadcasting a soccer match between two teams, the Caledonian Thistle and the Ari United teams. I'm sure I've never heard of them before, but they were playing. And it was well looked forward to in, in, in Scotland to watch this match. However, in order to reduce the number of people that it takes to actually broadcast a soccer game, the TV network that was broadcasting it decided to launch something new. What they were launching was a pair of artificially intelligent based cameras to broadcast the action. In other words, no human was necessary. The camera was going to follow the action for the broadcast. What a grand idea, you know, cameras don't get COVID, so there you go. Well, they had a little problem. Obviously, the human programming is what was entered into the system. And it was programmed to follow a soccer ball. Makes sense so far, doesn't it? Except there was a fly in this ointment, or a problem afoot, and it was a linesman. He had no hair on his head. He was bald. And every time the artificially intelligent, driven camera followed the ball and caught the linesman, it would stop and focus on the linesman moving up and down the line. <laughs> For those of you who think humans are going to be replaced, not quite yet. Not yet. Well, fans were just, you know, beside themselves because that was not what they wanted to watch. As a matter of fact, even a goal was missed live because all of a sudden the camera stopped at the bald linesman. Uh, Believe it or not, uh, they finally got the linesman to put on a cap, <laughs> and it solved the problem. But uh, during the action, it was hard to get him to put on a cap when he was moving on the line. Uh, amazing how it is. We want to see how things really are. The linesman was real, and watching him was, I'm sure, interesting for his family, maybe. 
But the rest of the soccer fans, it wasn't what they wanted to see. What do you focus on? Well, obviously, if you're a human and you've come to see a soccer game, you focus on the soccer ball. That's the focus, not the bald linesman. It's amazing how we've lost focus about the world Jesus came into. Uh, we want to see at Christmas the beauty of the baby, the manger. Oh, isn't that cute? Oh, that's so sweet. It's so wonderful. The shepherds, the angels. We want to see all those things. But today I want to focus on something we less want to see. Maybe let's call it the ugly bald linesman of Christmas. And I could have put that in the message as the title, but it didn't fit the theme, so I didn't. But Jesus came into a world of ugly wickedness. And it's seen not so much in the birth setting in Luke 2, but it's really seen in Matthew 2, where you have the wonderful picture of those uh, magi, the wise men coming. And that is a very wonderful picture. But behind the scenes of their arrival in Israel, you have this whole per picture of wickedness, the wicked world Jesus came to. First, we see the wickedness that isn't quite so bad, or at least it isn't at the moment we see it. And that's early in the chapter, verses 2, 3, 4. We see the wise men, the magi, coming to try and find where Jesus was. They go to Herod, the king. We'll talk about him later. But in verse 4, the chief priests and scribes, the Jewish leaders, are gathered together to try and tell Herod where this baby king of the Jews is supposed to be born. Because prophetically, in verse 6, they tell him, Bethlehem. They tell the wise men, go to Bethlehem. That's prophetically where this new king should be born. And they don't look too bad. I mean, they're upright-looking guys, chief priests, scribes. Perhaps this is the best view of them you'll see in the Bible. Because later on, they begin to look worse and worse as time goes by. As Jesus becomes a young man and then a man, and they uh, begin to see his ministry, they completely reject it, completely won't follow him, completely turn upon him. Eventually, they will crucify him. But at the moment here... They just look like average people, Jewish leaders. They seem to be relatively good, but in heart we know that their goodness is only on the surface, don't we, because of what they do later. We know that later on they will show themselves to be of, of wicked character and of wicked heart. And they are the leaders of the nation of Israel. And they are wicked and Jesus will call out their wickedness when he becomes an adult. And they will go to all ends to come against him and then crucify him. So we have average run-of-the-mill wickedness. And we can all tolerate that. Can't we? We do, don't we? Are there wicked people in places of power today? Well, there's a dumb question. Of course there are. In every country, probably around this world, you have wicked people in places of power. Uh, and so it was back then. And we tolerate that. We even vote for some of them, don't we? Uh, matter of fact, if, if there's a chance you have a choice where there's somebody not wicked to vote for, we count it a privilege to be able to vote in that particular time because we suspicion perhaps power has gone to the head and hearts of many who obtain it. And so it was with the Jewish leaders of that day. We tolerate that, we look at that, and we say, just don't cross a line, and we can get along with that. But then there's Herod. Herod crosses the line. And he shows us, by crossing the line of a ruling Roman, of wickedness that is hard to tolerate, but that is a capability of humanity. The Roman leaders were a vile, repulsive, horrible strain of humanity. Indeed, the Jewish leaders at this time looked so much better. The scribes, Pharisees, chief priests, they all looked so much better than Herod and the, the Roman leaders. 
The Roman leaders were unethical, immoral, self-loving, hating of others, valuing no life other than their own, uh, utterly self-centered, and just purely wicked. If you remember in Rome, not in Israel, Herod's in Israel, but over in Rome at the, at the center of the Roman Empire, we have the Colosseum where the fans and the people of uh, Rome came not to watch a soccer ball. You know, once in a while, Becca will attest to the fact somebody gets injured playing soccer. Once in a while, it happens. However, when you're being fed to the lions, somebody gets injured every time. And for the Romans, their sport was not watching a football, a soccer ball, a baseball, a basketball, or any other kind of sport that we enjoy, perhaps as Americans. It was people being tossed to the lions, cheering for, yes, the lions, of course. They didn't cheer for the humans. Uh, they had human dueling. They had Roman soldiers chasing people around to kill them. The Colosseum was filled with just debauchery of games and sport and entertainment. And of all that, the Roman people said, it's just fun and games. As long as they don't throw me down there with the lion, it's just something to watch. The ugliness of humanity in the city of Rome uh, was beyond what we as even in our society could probably tolerate or stomach at this point. And Herod, from that birth, from that background, from that wickedness, being a king, now king of Israel, he is ultimately so self-centered that he hears of these wise men coming into town saying, we're looking for the new king, and immediately he stirred up. You don't want to push Herod's buttons, just tell him a new king has arrived. You will push his buttons. And oh, a new baby king born, and immediately he plays so very nice with the wise men. Oh, guys, come back and tell me where this new baby's born so I can worship him too. Doesn't that sound so wonderful and so nice and so loving and so respectful? That's not Herod. He doesn't have those things in his being. Loving, respectful, kind, doesn't know the words, knows how to play the part, doesn't know how to be that. And so they leave and they, they find actually baby Jesus in a home in Bethlehem. They worship. It's a wonderful setting. That's one of the focus scenes we like to focus on at Christmas. And then they leave and they get a dream from God that don't go back to Herod. And so they sneak out of Israel another way. And finally Herod catches on. They're not coming back. And he gets his true character roused. He gets mad. You see, two things he knew that were part of his character. One was selfishness and the other was anger. He wanted nothing to do with a future king. Now think about this for a second. Do the math. I'm not a math person, but I can figure this one out. Baby king, you know, just born relatively, according to the wise men, within the last couple years. And you're Herod. How long does Herod really think he's going to stay as king of Israel? Obviously for baby king, who's just born, to grow up, become an adult, and the place of where he could be a threat to the kingship of Herod is going to be how long? Well, Jesus started his ministry about, you know, age 29 or 30, right? So that's about the time. This is a threat how long from now? 30 years from now. I'm going to guess in the last week, few of you have spent all kinds of your time thinking about what's about to happen 30 years from now. Isn't that true? Now, maybe something quickly spurred you on to think of, I wonder in 30 years if. But it probably wasn't the focus of your last week. It probably wasn't something you spent a lot of time thinking about. Man, 30 years from now, I will be how many years old? That's just enough of a discouragement right there to stop thinking about it. More or less going on to think about the problems of 30 years from now. But Herod is so self-focused, he just has this idea that he will be the king of Israel for almost what he thinks is forever. And a, a future rival 30 years from now, we've got to do something about that. 
And that's where his evil anger comes in. So what does he choose to do when he can't find the particular baby? Well, I think we see from what he do does, we know what he was going to do if he could find the particular baby. But he can't find the particular baby. He's reduced to male children to and under in Bethlehem and, and the regions around it. So in his evil, he decides, well, if I can't just get rid of that baby, I will make sure I get rid of that baby, and I will get rid of all the male children of that age. Do all humans get to this level of wickedness? No. All humans do not. Do all humans become slaughterers? No. But understand, this is the race and the depths of where this race of humanity we live in can go. The Bible says through the prophet Jeremiah, and you can look it up later, I'll read it to you, chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then verse 10 answers the question, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. The Lord knows it. No, we all will not be to the depths and the level of wickedness that humanity can reach, but we are a part of a humanity that is filled with the potential for wickedness. That's our plight. Jesus came to a world of wickedness, and should he have come at any other time, he would have found similar atrocities to Herod, going on in any time, in any place. Maybe those atrocities aren't happening in our little neighborhood, in our little corner of New York here today. But around this world today, if you will open your eyes to understand what goes on in some countries that we're thankful we're not a part of, atrocities and the value of life is really held to a minimal standard in some places. It is just the sad truth of every generation, of every time. And why is that the sad truth? of any time in any generation? Why are there always, it seems, another Herod stepping up to fulfill this role of atrocity and terror? It's because as humans, we're sinners. And while we may not all get to the level of this nature of sin, we all are sinners. And the Lord looks down upon this race of humanity as a race of wickedness. Jesus came from the pure heaven to this. And it is quite the change. It is quite the difference. I truly believe when the Lord takes us to be with him and we get to heaven, one of the things we will notice is there's no wickedness up here because it will stand out to us so used to wickedness. Wickedness must be tolerated at least to some level, right? If we didn't tolerate the wickedness of the world to some level, could we even live in this world? Probably not. That's the situation. But just as we looked at last week, it's a world of hardship. Today we call it a world of wickedness. This is the point why Jesus came. That's the point. If you focus on the wickedness, you will understand more fully why he came. He came to provide to a wicked world forgiveness. Humanity chooses to search for an answer without Jesus. Humanity looks for a way to be right with God without having to be forgiven. Humanity lots of times looks toward works. Maybe if I could just be better. Maybe if I could be more like the Jewish leaders. Oh, that's not a good thing to say for those of us who knew what they were like. Maybe if I could be just more and more like this or a little more like that. Somehow, God will find favor with me. And that's a bad choice because the sin already committed is already written in the accountability book of what you're going to be held accountable for. And it's not a matter of stopping the bleeding of ink into your book of writing down sin, it's a matter of what to do with the stuff that's already written down. 
I wonder how many authors there are who write books, and I've never wrote a book, but I wonder how many authors they are have written 100, 200 pages, and get to that point where they literally throw it out and say, it's not going to work, it's awful, and they toss it. That's quite the statement, but when they look at those pages, they say, I can't go that far, I can't go with this book, it's not going to work, and they start over. Wouldn't you have the idea that for sin, the best way and the only way is to what? Start over. Now try and pull that one off. The problem is every time humanity starts over, we start over with what? Another batch of little sinners, don't we? With another half book written of sin. And even if we could stop adding to it, the question still is, what do I do with all the sin I've committed already? Jesus came to solve that problem. Had he turned to Jesus, a man as vile, as wicked, as repulsive as Herod was, could have been forgiven and saved. We have no evidence this man did. Matter of fact, we have evidence that suggests he did not. But nonetheless, the forgiveness of Christ is for all of us who find ourselves mired in our own personal sin and wickedness. That's what Jesus came to do, to provide forgiveness. The phrase Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came to be with us and live amongst us in an environment of sin. And as he lived with us in this environment of sin, in human form, as a human body, he dwelt, upon, dwelt in and lived upon the earth, we find that he was not affected by sin, that he did it. Unlike us, easily influenced by other sinners, our surroundings, and our own sin nature that we're born with, Jesus did not have the sin nature being conceived of the Spirit, and he wasn't influenced to sin from those around him. You would say, if you watch Jesus' life, when is he finally going to straighten some of this mess out? You know, I think perhaps the sin against Jesus that may have been the most hurtful was when Judas Iscariot, one of his twelve, betrayed him. If you've ever been betrayed by somebody you thought to have been a friend, you will understand a little bit about what that is. It's not just the wickedness of some evil ruler, Herod, who doesn't know you and you don't personally know him and don't want to know him. It's not just the evil of somebody out there who, who broke into your car and took your change out of your glove box, who you don't know and you never saw and, you know, quite honestly, you're never going to find, probably. It's a friend. A so-called comrade, partner, brother, friend, and they stick it to you. And that hurts. Perhaps unlike any other hurt. I do not believe Jesus was above the actual pain of that hurt when Judas betrayed him. I think he felt that the same way you and I feel that if it happens to you and me. And yet, the olive branch of forgiveness was still available for Judas while he was still here. When Judas came with the soldiers who he had tipped off to Jesus' location to arrest Jesus, Jesus addressed him in this phrase, friend, why have you come? Friend. There was still the chance for renewed friendship. There always is with Jesus. That's what he came to do, to forgive, to renew our fellowship and our friendship with God. He came unto his own, the Jewish people, but his own received him not, John said. But then John said this, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. The opportunity to reestablish a kinship with God broken by our sin nature and our birth comes through Jesus Christ, available for all who would call upon him, held back from none no matter what you've done, no matter how wicked you've been. Even for Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, there was still the opening 
Repent and believe and come to me and be my friend, Jesus says. This is why he came to bring forgiveness to a wicked world. In Mark chapter 2, and I'll read a few verses here, Jesus, early in his ministry, points out what it's all about. Now an adult in Mark 2, going out to minister to people, he heals this man, or is going to heal this man who's lowered through a roof. In verse 4 of that chapter, a man sick of palsy, they have to let the bed down into where Jesus is. And in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I'm pretty sure at first that might not have been why they came. The guy was paralyzed, the guy couldn't move, he was strapped to a makeshift stretcher, lowered in through a thatched roof just to get to Jesus, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Yes, Jesus would heal him momentarily. But that statement created more of a stir than the healing. These same Jewish leaders who look so respectable and so nice and so, you know, up in front and, and righteous, in verse 8, immediately, you know, he perceived in their spirit something, and that's in verse 7. You know, they were quietly wondering and reasoning, why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God only? Immediately discounting that this could be the Savior. Immediately rejecting that there was a Savior amongst them who could say, your sins are forgiven you. So Jesus says, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of thy palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin, he then saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and he walked away. As proof that Jesus not only has power over the, the bodily inf in problems we have, the infections, the diseases, the inflictions, but that Jesus also truly has, being the Son of God, come to die on the cross for us, the power to do what? Forgive sin. Jesus came to forgive a wicked world. He is the answer to the problem. He's an answer to the difficulty. The wickedness we see of the world he was brought to and came to is why he came. To forgive humanity for as many as receive him to them. He gives right or power even today to become children of God, forgiven. The beginning of the book, all that ink you've already put in there, if you've never trusted him today, every sin ever written accountable to you, rightfully placed, those evil things you did to family, those evil things you did to a brother or sister, those evil things you did at work, the things you may have stole, the words you may have said that were nasty and cruel and hateful, all the thoughts that you had in your mind that were truly poisonous and some you wouldn't even act upon. All of it, the ink is erased. An author writing a book gets halfway through and says, this is garbage, I can't go on. It throws the words in the garbage, but they're still on the pages. Off to the dump, but still on the pages. Jesus comes to your book of your sins when you come to him as Savior, and he erases it all. The ink has disappeared. You open the book and there's nothing there to be seen. That's forgiveness. We live in a strange world, don't we? We live in a weird world at times. A couple years ago, a couple was sound asleep in the middle of the night. They woke to noises in their house. That's never a good thing. The man, the husband, grabbed his, we'll call it for this purpose, his handheld security device. All right, he grabbed that and a flashlight and began to search for the cause of the noises. He soon found the cause of what he was hearing. There was a young man in the house, and he was playing with electronic equipment, yelling. He said, put your hands up. You're not stealing my stuff tonight. The home invader puts his hands up, 
and says, you've got it all wrong. I'm not here to take anything. I need a Wi-Fi connection. Indeed, he was fiddling with the Wi-Fi and the router. I caught your signal outside and I found an open window. So I came in to push the WPS button so I could connect my phone, which he had in his hand. There was a somewhat skeptical homeowner at that point. Police were called, the guy was arrested. They only charged him with the, the entry and the trespass because he hadn't taken anything yet. There was nothing of their stuff on him. And his story was at least semi-believable up until the point he unplugged the router, I guess. But, uh, you know, it was seemingly believable. Uh, but they couldn't charge him with actually burglarizing any items. Maybe he was just searching for a Wi-Fi connection. I would suggest if you need a Wi-Fi connection, not to go through somebody's window to try and get one. That would be my suggestion, you know, if you're happening to search for a Wi-Fi connection. We do live in a world that we need Wi-Fi connections. And I guess if you need it bad enough, you'll go to who knows what level to get one. I know years ago, and I think a couple of you still live in a neighborhood where you had to hold your cell phone up just to get a phone connection. I, I've heard of those neighborhoods. I haven't lived in one in a long time, but they, they exist still. And hopefully you can get a connection with your cell phone as you hold it up there. You know, searching for a connection. I just wish our world would search as hard for forgiveness of sin as they search for a connection to the internet. Don't you wish that were true? We search for what we perceive to need. We look for that which we seem to desire. We live in a world of wickedness in desperate need of forgiveness. Nobody seeming to search for the forgiveness that they need. It is the truth that without a connection, your cell phone will do very little other than act as a calculator or maybe play you a little music as you wander around without connection. It is true that years ago, those things that used to hang on the wall with the little dial in them, if the, the, the telephone line got cut, you had no connection. For those of you who go back to the day that you dialed a, that thing up and you talked to Millie in Westfield, uh, or whoever her name was, without that line connecting you to Millie, you, you weren't going to talk to her as she sat there as the operator of the day. We always need a connection to something to make those kinds of things work and exist. The greatest connection we need is to Jesus, and for many it's the last one they'll ever search for, and it's the last one they'll ever come about and find. Because they don't perceive that's the one they need. At this Christmas season, understand the greatest need of the world is the wickedness of our sin. And why was Jesus here? To meet the need we have and forgive us. We're like the camera run by a computer. Soccer ball, soccer ball. Oh, bald-headed linesman, let me focus on him. Can't tell the difference. And our world is so caught up with focusing on the wrong thing, it misses the one thing it needs. Can you imagine today if you were to watch a soccer game or even a football game, and the only thing on your TV was a referee as he ran around, nothing else. I imagine some of you would be disturbed. That's my guess. And our world is disturbingly focused on all the wrong things, something that will never, ever meet their need. Matter of fact, they're not even searching for the right thing. They're content to focus on the linesman. Father, help us to see that you came for purpose and for reason. Jesus arrived here with a plan, with a point. It wasn't make it up as he went. It wasn't hopefully he'll accomplish something. It wasn't a last-ditch effort. This was the plan that in a world of hardship you bring to us who are Christians joy, which we looked at last week, and to a world of wickedness 
you bring to us forgiveness. And we would plead that if there's anybody here today or watching this as a video later, that they might take a look and ask, what am I focused on? Am I focused on the fact that I'm part of the wickedness? I've never come to believe in Jesus. And the greatest need I've had, I've ignored, maybe up until today. The greatest need we had is met by a baby born, a young man who taught, and a man who died for our sins, taking the punishment and penalty for us on a cross. And if we've never believed by faith in that Savior, in what he did, in why he came, we are left with our book of sin still intact, written and still writing, still being added to, someday to be held accountable for it all. Because the one thing we need, forgiveness to do away with all that ink, we're not focused on that, we're not looking for that, and we're not discovering it. May no one leave this place without that Savior who forgives our sin, for it is why you came. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will close with a song. You can stand together. O little town of Bethlehem, why was he there? Why was Jesus in the little town of Bethlehem? In the middle of a night that was dark and normal and quiet. I don't believe there's anybody stealing Wi-Fi signals there either in Bethlehem. Very peaceful night. He was there because we needed him to be there. So let's sing about it together. Father, we thank you that we can gather today to think about why you came, to be blessed because if we know you as Savior, we know this forgiveness that you provided. We rejoice in it. We're thankful for it. We're thankful that even today when that word that comes out that's sinful that we perhaps have tried our hardest not to say, that we're thankful that there's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. 
and that we know you who forgives, and you wipe that, removing it from our account, uh, just taking it away because of what you've done for us out of love and compassion. And this is why you came. May we go forth this week rejoicing in what you've done for us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.